So today we're going to talk about DC electricity, where DC is direct current. So we'll talk about AC for alternating current. Uh, probably not for two weeks. And so this week and both sessions next week will be all about DC direct current electricity. So for voltage, we have three things that we need to get through to get started on DC electricity. So we've got to start somewhere. So we're going to start with voltage. So you may recognize something like this. And it probably says something like 1.5 with a capital V. Or perhaps a square one about the same size. I think the big one is positive, and the little one is negative, and that one might say 9V on it. Jim. Yes. Have you ever put that bottom battery on your tongue? I have put that bottom battery on my tongue, yeah. <laughs> Wild, isn't it? <laughs> I encourage all of you to go get a 9-volt battery and uh, test that there actually is 9 volts in there. Yeah, it tastes good. It's uh, it's it's sort of safe. So batteries. So a lot of our analysis is going to revolve around around batteries or around the idea of batteries. So that 1.5 or that 9, is also known as an electrical potential difference. And Another thing about all batteries is you have two points of contact. So the 9 volts or the 1.5 means that you have to pick a point A and a point B. And if it's a battery, it's by design. You know where they are. Uh, and the difference between those points is then known as the rating. Uh, and so voltage is absolute in this sense. So there's no negative voltage and there's no like uh, baseline voltage. Uh, it all depends on what the other terminal is. So it all depends on the local conditions. So in this case, plus 1.5 is only between is only between the negative and the positive at this end. And this 9 volt is a completely different system. So again, only between the two terminals. So another battery looks something like this, so a little bit bigger, uh, and a square, and probably a couple of kilos this would weigh. So in an automotive battery, generally they're rated at 12 volts. Or a marine battery. 
They maintain around 12 volts, and they're much, much bigger than the other batteries. But it's not like they're, they don't scale up in voltage, even though they scale up in size. So that's an important bit. You can have a tiny, tiny battery with a high voltage, or you can have a very big battery with a very low voltage. Uh, Tesla's, the entire car has individual three volt batteries is what it's made of. And they are just a little bit bigger than a standard AA battery. Uh, and so we'll go through how they, how they scale up. So the red wire here is on the positive. or the live, and usually it's red. So that's just by standard, probably because if you can see your blood, you're in a lot of trouble, and you can see the red. Uh, so the, the positive is always red. If you don't see a positive and negative, but you have two wires, or you have a group of wires, the live one is probably the red one, and that means that the, gra the black one, also known as the ground, is usually black. Um, or negative, okay, so positive and then negative. So that means that here on side A, I've got a bunch of positive charge. So these are my charges. And then on plate B, I'm going to have a bunch of negative charges. And so these parallel plates are separated by a small distance D. And we're going to use this just to define our voltage. So if we look inside, uh, we could take an arrangement like this, actually, and you can create um, what's called a capacitor by having two oppositely charged parallel plates. So we'll come to that in a little bit. Uh, but we're going to use this to set up a definition of what, what does voltage actually mean. So if I redraw my plates here, and one side is negative. And one side is positive. So last day we looked at electrostatic charges or individual point charges. And so we can take a charge. So here's Q. And I'm going to say Q is positive. So we can take a charge and we can put it between the two plates. and we can predict what's going to happen. So we know that opposite charges, so we have a positive Q and we have a negative side over here. So those opposite charges are likely to attract. And then on the right hand side, we have like charges which are going to repel. So this Q, if everything else is nice and equal, should want to move to the left. And it's moving inside an electric field. So again, if we have charges, then that also means we have an electric field everywhere that you have charges. So over here, we also have an electric field. And I'm just going to sketch in some field lines here. And we call this capital E for electric field. And 
Again, from last class, we talked about the force. If you put something inside an electric field, it feels a real force. And that force should be parallel to the field. So that kind of makes sense. It's going to go in line with my, with my setup here. And so my charge Q experiences a force. and moves in the field. So now we kind of cross over with physics A a bit. If something has to move, then there has to be real physics work done in order for it to move. So nothing comes for free. So you can't have particles teleporting from one spot to the next. Uh, and so at, as that point charge moves, there's real work associated with that motion. I say real, but of course it's real. That's kind of redundant. There's real work. Uh, and also from physics A, if you're not studying physics A, that's okay, but there's the work energy theorem, which links those two together. So anytime you move something, it has to take energy. And so we have to expend some energy for this charge to move in the field. So we're thinking energy. Okay, so we can define what's happening here. We want to know what voltage is. So capital V for volts. And my triangle here means change in volts or delta. So this is capital delta for change. So the delta for my battery would be 1.5. Between the positive and the negative, you, depending on the direction, you either go up or down, 1.5. So for voltage, we're going to have a change in potential energy. So right, energy associated with work because the charge moved. And then we want to know how much there was of it. So we'll divide by the individual charge. In this case, just Q by itself, little Q. We're going to have a big Q in a second. So what's, what's voltage? Well, it's energy divided by charge. And let's talk about some units. So it's lowercase v, lowercase volts, or capital V to short form it. And that's from this dude called Volta, An Italian dude, Alessandro. And my units for energy are going to be in joules, so that's capital J. And charge we talked about last day, same as static charge, charge is in coulombs. So all these units are named after scientists. So by themselves, they don't really have a fundamental meaning, it's just named after the scientist who either worked on them or perhaps initially discovered the properties and then later got their names. So a volt is the same as a joule per coulomb. 
I think if you just remember it as energy over charge, that's a little bit easier to think about. Voltage is energy divided by charge. So a nine volt battery, we have a ratio of energy per charge as nine, or we have nine joules of energy for every single Coulomb. Okay, so real quick, just a little analogy here in terms of, let's see, maybe we have a large pool down here and then sort of narrows out. So a river analogy for the voltage. So it's hard to figure out what voltage actually means. Even if you know it's energy over charge, it's hard to think about what that means. Um, but the river analogy for voltage and for current can help. So I'll talk about current in a second. But here I've got a waterfall. And the waterfall is the voltage. Specifically, we could have A difference in height. So the bigger the waterfall represents a larger amount of voltage and that is my electrical potential difference. And let's rewrite this in green. So then a little bit further downstream, we have the idea of current. And so current is the volume of water in the river. So at some point you have a lot of current, and some points you have uh, not a lot of current. Or you could have zero current if it's not moving anywhere. If it's just still water, you could have zero current. Uh, and that's the idea of the Van de Graaff generator from last class, high voltage, so a large waterfall, but not a lot of current. And so that's why it's safe. Um, so voltage we could think of as the pressure and pressure kind of pushes or pulls, so it's the pressure pushing the electrical charge. And then current is actually how much electrical charge is moving. Volume of water, how much charge. So people talk about electrical flow or electricity flowing. 
current flow, that's where they get the idea from, sort of maps nicely to the idea of a river. Okay, so the second piece here, voltage is the first, the second piece is current. So current's a bit easier to figure out here. And all it has to do with is how much charge moves past a fixed point. So we could have here Imagine a surface or a 2D point in the river, so just a plane that's fixed in there. We're going to have some current flowing through, so we'll have maybe a lot upstream and a little bit downstream of that point. So maybe I'll draw like six arrows here. These are all cues, so these are all charges. And these are all in, going in. And then the, the number of cues coming out number of cues coming out does not have to be the same as the cues going in. Right? If those charges were quite happy just to sit there, if these cues were quite happy not to be impelled to move through this plane, then they don't get out and we're in a static scenario. If they all move through, then the current goes up. Okay, so current gets the letter I. Voltage is V, current is I. And what we do here is we take the total charge or capital Q and we divide by time. So three lines just means like a definition here. So capital Q is the total charge. Each individual charge is super tiny and has, you know, an electron has times 10 to the minus 19 or whatever the constant is. Uh, and that's not really a helpful number. We want to build circuits. We want to be able to actually run stuff. Uh, so we'll use capital Q, and that means we're just adding up the total charge. All the little Qs. Okay, so my units now, I have a new unit for current, it's A for amperes. And then same as before, coulombs. And then time is in seconds. So one amp is one coulomb per second. Normally shortened just to amps. So if we think about my river, or even my 2D surface here, let's go look at the river. If I have an obstruction in the river, so maybe a tree falls over here, that's going to slow down the current, and it'll tend to pool upstream, and then it slows down the downstream charge that can get through. And so the same thing 
applies for electrical circuits. So if I put a barrier maybe here at the neck, so if I introduce some barrier that blocks a bit of the flow. So electrically, this is called resistance. So on my 2D surface here, we got what, six going in and three going out. That means that the past this point, I've encountered some resistance and only three of them made it through. So that is the third part. Okay, let's do a quick calculation. So part A, find the current. Let's just step back. Current here is charge divided by time. So from the definition, we can just write that as a formula. So I... equals charge over time. We have to check our SI units. So both seconds and coulombs are in SI units. So that passes. So just straightforward from the definition, we can say that I equals 1.67. <coughs> over 2 or 0 0.8 and then the SI units for current now are just in amps and so you can just write capital A Point eight three five amps. Kind of a silly question. That's a that's a pretty big current, but that's what the numbers tell us. So part B. How many electrons? So we want to think here that electrons. E minus, this is the charge. So in electrical components and circuits, electrons are responsible for the charge. So let's rearrange our formula above and say that charge equals time times current. So this charge is actually the total Q, whereas the electron charge is just the little individual Q. So we want to find out how many little Qs make up the big Q. So we know that big Q is 1.67. So the charge here will say, find the number of electrons. That's what I'm looking for. And then I know each electron has a charge. This ridiculously tiny number, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. 
and then this equals time times current, so five seconds. And then current we just calculated. And solve for the number of electrons. So electrons, we'll just divide by that number. You got two point six. Two point six times ten to the nineteen. Okay, so it's really big. So each charge is a really each electron is a really really tiny charge. And then if we have times 10 to the 19 of them, then we, accum uh, then we um, accommodate for the total charge of 1.67 coulombs. So this tells me that an individual coulomb is actually quite a bit, and it, and it is, because an individual electron is not a lot at all. And so this is electrons. Now it's nothing to be worried about because electrons are everywhere and there's a lot of them. A copper wire is just full of electrons. So it's not like you won't have enough electrons available to do whatever it is that you're after. So the third piece, I said there would be three pieces. We did voltage, current, and now resistance. So resistance is this natural blockage that occurs because electrons aren't uh, moving through completely empty space. And we're going to direct them and guide them into doing work in our electrical circuit, and that's all going to count as resistance. So as soon as current moves, as soon as you flick the switch, um, basically we can say that there is resistance. So another way to say this is that with current brings resistance. Or, you know, you can't have one without the other. So capital R for resistance. And this one is going to say how much voltage do we have per unit of current. So again, delta V, that's a potential difference. So a difference in the height of that waterfall. <clears throat> if there's no difference in that waterfall and they're level, then the voltage is zero. So the units we can sub in the units for volts and the units for current, and this is now called an ohm. OHM. 
and the letter is capital Omega. So another unit here, capital Omega, that might be a new symbol. You can look up your Greek alphabet. I believe the dude's name is Georg Ohm, who's responsible for this one. So they say, how much resistance is that speaker rated at? And it'll say 75 ohms or 10 ohms. Okay, so this one is quite special. It gets a nice box. Uh, and this relationship between resistance voltage and current is commonly referred to as Ohm's law. So this time I'll give him a capital. This was a real person. So this is Ohm's law. And you could rearrange it. I like to rearrange it so that it says ver. So multiply through by current. Current comes over here, and I get V equals IR. But either of, the, either, either of those forms are equivalent. And so you can rearrange that little formula. If you know two pieces, you can solve for resistance. If you know voltage and current, or any two out of three, and you can solve for the third one. So these are the three main pieces for circuits that we're going to look at here in FISB. We will also look at capacitors, but we will not look at inductors. That's We'll save that for electrical principles A next, either next year or next semester, depending on your pathway. Oh, we have a whole slide for Ohm's law. Let's pull it out. V equals IR. Done. All right, so I got a couple examples for us. Presumably, we'll be using Ohm's law. So this one just illustrates the difference between uh, something being wet and something being dry. So if you're in a wet scenario, if it's raining, or if you have wet hands, uh, you could experience more of a shock than in the same scenario with dry hands. So we've got some real values here. So if the current along a path through the thumb and index finger exceeds 80, and then we have microamps. So that's our first thing here, is that the, the, the U is actually a mu, mu, and it means micro. So this is mu for microamps. And a micro is times 10 to the minus six. So our earlier example, we had like point, point 0.9 or point 0.8 amps. That's a lot. Microamps is something that you could feel a shock for. Okay, so compare the maximum possible voltage if your skin resistance changes. So we've got two different values here dry and wet. And so these would be measured and calculated in a lab. These aren't determined mathematically. Um, the resistances of all natural materials you can look up on Wikipedia. I think I've got a table in the next slide, but these are measured. And if you need a resistance in a future question, it will be given to you just like here. Okay, so let's start with the dry. Uh, 
So using Ohm's law, V equals I R. And if we look at this relationship, just before we get into the math, if I look at this relationship, if I in the equation goes up, in order to keep voltage the same, then R has to go down. So in order to maintain a constant V, if I goes to a million, R needs to go down by a lot in order to hold this true and in reverse as well. So here our, our value is changing, so R is going to be different for the two of them. And that means that if I is held constant, V, the output will change. So you can kind of predict, if you have an equation like this, you can predict the behavior just by looking at how the equation is set up. Okay, so I stays the same, so let's put it in, 80, and then it's times 10 to the minus 6. And then R dry is 4 times 10 to the 5. I've got SI units, so I'm okay. Well, I should say that after I've typed in times 10 to the minus 6, now I have SI units. So if you just put in 80, then we're going to be off. So I need the times 10 to the minus 6. Okay, so this one comes out to 32 volts. For the dry. So the only difference in the wet scenario is that the resistance changes and it goes down. So we had times 10 to the 5 and now we have times 10 to the 3. So 80 micro and then 2 times 10 to the 3 or 2,000 ohms. So I got less than a single volt. So this tells me something about the overall behavior here. It tells me that you can't really withstand a voltage in this scenario if it's wet conditions, but you can if it's dry conditions. Or we could say the dry conditions and you could do that division, these are about 200 times safer. than the wet condition. So this just shows you that resistance can change depending on the scenario. And indeed, if you are working with circuits and electricity, you want to be aware how much current is in the circuit that you're dealing with and what the conditions are. Current's usually the most important thing. Okay, let's just have a quick look at some of these resistances here. So I have a column here showing me the resistivity, and this number is small, silver, copper, gold. So I guess uh, last week, when we had our periodic table, we looked at these. So these are good conductors. 
and a conductor is opposite of um, a resistor. So a good conductor is a bad resistor. And then, so that, those are times 10 to the minus 8. And then as I get down here to like silicon and glass, these are large numbers. And so these are good because they're big resistors. So that means they're good resistors but bad conductors. So conductors and resistors are just properties of the material and they end up being opposites or having opposing behavior. So small, these are good conductors, bad resistors. And once we have the data here, we can see that you want to use silver if you want a good conductor, and if you want a good resistor, then you want to use something like silicon or glass. Of course, glass is just a crystal of silicon. Um, even something like rubber is a pretty common resistor or insulator. Okay, so another one on my list here is nichrome, a nickel chromium alloy. So let's see. So nichrome here with a little subscript C, commonly used in heating elements. And it's sort of part way down the list. So its resistivity is two orders of magnitude bigger than the rest of the common conductors which is why it's used in heating elements. All right, so these are heaters. These are hobs, stoves, and ovens. So a heater is a s really simple device, right? We've got the apocalypse coming up once everyone gets sick. So it might be a good idea to know how to make a heater. But all you need is some wire, put it into a coil, and then you attach uh, a source of current to either end to create a circuit. So it's really easy to make a heater. Um, so what happens is the nichrome wire acts as a very strong resistor and because you're dumping a lot of electrical charge, those little cues through the wire, uh, they're going to end up heating up the, um, the material around it. Uh, so the same thing from, not these lights, these lights are fluorescent, uh, but the same thing for a filament light bulb. Um, you pass some current through the filament and it heats up to the point of giving off light. So they're actually, light bulbs are better heaters than they are torches, um, but that's just, that's just the way it goes. You can't get around it. So here we're looking for current. So we can go back to Ohm's law straight away. And if I just rearrange this, Current equals V over R. And I can sub in my voltage and my resistance. Both of these are in SI units. We get three amps. So the calculation is not that tricky, but it gives you an idea that you can calculate the amperage that's required to run something without, with only knowing the voltage and the resistance. And the resistance is probably something you can just look up, uh, and the voltage you can probably set on, depending on your power source. <coughs> 
this is a spectrum. And it basically has no limits because it's just numbers in a line. So these numbers are getting bigger, right? Coming down. 70 quartz, which is a perfect crystal. 75 times 10 to the 16. Well, you could imagine something that has times 10 to the 17 resistivity. Or going the other way, you could have something 10 to the minus 10 resistivity. So it's on a spectrum. So you may have heard something called superconductors. And these kind of have interesting futuristic properties. Here we have a curve showing the temperature compared to the resistivity. So this means that if you change the temperature in something, then you also change its resistive properties. So this is for a sample of mercury. The graph follows out of a normal metal above the critical temperature. So TC here is the critical temperature. And this is in kelvins. So this is very cold. If I extend my graph to the left at zero Kelvin, this is called absolute zero. And it's a theoretical point. Uh, but scientists using a lot of cold stuff can, uh, using things like liquid nitrogen, can get things very, very cold. Um, I don't think, I mean, you, you can approach zero, but you can't really get there. It's kind of like one of these limits that you'll study in calculus class. Anyways, four Kelvins, this is like minus uh, 269 degrees, right? So pretty, pretty darn cold. But we get these interesting properties. So look at the data points here. So here's my resistivity at 4.25 Kelvins. And then the next point on the graph is pretty much zero at 4.1 Kelvins. So we kind of have this skip, this discontinuity in the graph. And this is where you get these superconducting properties. Uh, so a superconductor is kind of an infinitely good conductor and an infinitely bad resistor, right? Good conductor, bad resistor. So here's another chart talking about some superconductors. And we can see here the critical temperature. So we just looked at mercury, 4.15. Obviously, it takes a lot of energy to cool things down. But at room temperature, 273 Kelvin, um, if you could have a superconductor operating at that temperature, you'd have massive implications. And so we see here that some of these exotic materials are getting closer. So if you can have a superconductor at a usable sort of human temperature, with infinite conductivity, so some of the applications here involve the absence of heat. If you can have no resistance, then your um, electrical circuits can't heat up, and that will really scale things up and improve future technological outlook. A superconductor can have a resistance of essentially zero. What does this say about a superconducting circuit?